was March 2009 when we travelled to the American state of Florida to meet up with a then 73-year-old Vic Elford. The Englishman remains one of the greatest motor racing drivers of all time. During the 1960s and 70s, he displayed a versatility that remains unmatched in the sport. Quick Vic excelled in rallying, sports car racing, Formula One, Can-Am, Trans-Am, touring cars, NASCAR and even off-road events in Africa. Born in London in 1935, Vic caught the racing bug at an early age. When my father took me to see the very first British Grand Prix right after the war, right after, it was actually 1949, and I was 12, 13 years old then, and I decided when I saw that, that's what I was going to do. I was going to be a race driver. And my parents didn't have any money. I didn't have any money. And I, I didn't even have a car. When I, first, you know, when I got to the point of wanting to start something, and one of my friends at college... Um, decided that he was going to start rallying and he bought an MG and I was his co-driver, navigator, because he was navigator then really. And I navigated for him in little British rallies and then eventually um, got my own car and started doing little events and just sort of went from there. Vic competed in his first international event in 1960. He quickly began to enjoy considerable success in rallying, thanks in no small part to his trailblazing approach to the sport. Well, in fact, David Stone and I, my co-driver for a long period of time, we developed the pace notes to what they are today, basically. I think modern pace notes were almost were developed primarily by, by David and me to get to the point where I could literally drive uh, um, over a road that I'd never seen before, uh, in fog or at night, flat out. In the days before the creation of the WRC, the most prestigious rally series was the European Championship. In 1967, pioneering the use of the Porsche 911 in racing, Elford won this championship. A year later, he won the famous Monte Carlo Rally. It was whilst driving in various rallies for Porsche in the late 60s that Elford first got involved in sports car racing and Formula One. Just a week after winning the Monte Carlo Rally, Elford flew to America to compete in the 24 Hours of Daytona, driving a Porsche 907. It was the first time that Vic had been to the States, and he marked his debut there in style. In the first ever outright victory for Porsche in a long-distance race, Elford led the team home in a 1-2-3 finish. The 1968 season went on to become his best ever. I think I came second at Sebring that year, and then everything sort of tumbled. It was like being in a tumble dryer almost. I won the, the Targa Florio, won the 1,000 kilometres at Nürburgring. Uh, then uh, I had my first drive in a Grand Prix car and finished fourth at Rouen because it rained, because I had the lowest, worst, slowest car in the field. Uh, but it rained, and I used to like the rain. Another part of being able to drive anything anywhere. The highlight of Elford's incredible 1968 season was the Targa Florio victory. The Targa Florio was an open road endurance race held in Sicily that has assumed near mythical status. Founded in 1906, it used to be the oldest sports car racing event in the world. It was discontinued in 1977 due to safety concerns. The race covered 446 kilometres and led drivers through multiple hairpin bends from the coast up into the mountains around Palermo. Drivers practised in the week before the race in public traffic, often with their race cars fitted with licence plates. In 1968, Elford teamed up with veteran Umberto Malioli in a 907. 
Despite losing 18 minutes on the first lap due to a tyre failure, Elford led them to an astonishing victory. I actually started the second lap 18 minutes behind the, the leading car and I thought, well, that's it. There's no possible way to win the race, but I'm just going to make damn sure I have the lap record every lap. Melioli was doing well, but he wasn't as quick as me. He was about a minute slower. Then I said, you know, if I do the last three laps instead of just the last two, uh, we should be able to win. And uh, once they'd gone over the times and we decided I really could do those times again, I got back in the car a lap earlier. And at that point, it wasn't a question of doing lap records anymore. It was a question of making up the time to actually win the race, although they'd incorporated lap records as it happened at the same time. And so, of course, yeah, it was very satisfying to win. Elford set lap records at almost every circuit he raced on. Of all the places where he competed, his favourite was the old Nürburgring in Germany. He is one of only two men to have won on six separate occasions at the Nordschleifer, widely considered to be the most dangerous and most demanding track in the world. Competing in the World Sports Car Championship, he won the 1,000 kilometres in a Porsche 908 three times. Trying to learn the Nürburgring in the way normally one would for a race it was never really a, a horror for me because I had done so many, so many laps that it was just embedded in my mind. I probably knew it better than any other driver ever. Along with the likes of Jackie Ix, Mario Andretti and Derek Bell, Vic was a leading light in what is now considered the golden age of sports car racing. The sport even made it to the silver screen during this period, with Steve McQueen's 1971 film Le Mans. Hollywood star McQueen was a huge racing fan, and he hired Vic to do the high-speed close-up driving shots for the film, which was shot on location at the famous French circuit. Steve was a hell of a character, he was a really a nice guy to deal with. He was uh, absolutely mad, passionate about racing, but not just cars, but bikes as well. And uh, he was very easy going, very easy to get on with. Along with the happy memories of working with Steve McQueen, Le Mans also holds sad memories for Vic. His friend Joe Bonnier lost his life during the 1972 24-hour race. Bonnier and his Lola collided with a Ferrari Daytona. Elford was first on the scene, and the footage was captured by a local TV crew. By the time I actually got there, I'd slowed down. There was the Ferrari wedged up against the guardrail burning, and, my, and I couldn't see the Lola at all. It had simply disappeared. And I thought, well, the driver's got to be inside it, so I stopped and, and climbed out. So I rushed across the road, opened the door, looked inside, and there was no driver. And uh, what I didn't know was that the driver had actually had time to get out. Then I went back to the front of the car to look because I thought, well, you know, Joe's got to be around here somewhere, but his car had taken, literally taken off into the woods. It was shortly after the death of his friend that Elford decided that his days as a professional racing driver were over. However, Vic would remain actively involved in the sport. He was the manager of the ATS Formula One team, and in 1984, he moved to America, where he worked for Renault Jeep Sport and Porsche. To this day, Vic still follows motorsport, but isn't all that impressed with what he sees. The trouble is it's got Technically, it's got so out of hand. It's got to the point where all of the cars go around any track um, within a few tenths of a second each of each other. It looks like anybody can drive any of the cars at the same speed, uh, which wasn't the case in the in the case of 917 Porsches or Ferrari 512s or or Formula cars even 30, 40 years ago. There was a difference, and a, and a driver could make a difference. 
Vic spent the majority of his racing years behind the wheel of the iconic Porsche 917 and was the only person to race each edition of the car. But when we met him, we discovered that he was perfectly happy driving his old Ford Escort around Southern Florida. Alfred continues to live a quiet life in Fort Lauderdale with his wife. No other driver has enjoyed a more varied career at the elite level of motorsport, during which Vic Alfred was simply the complete racer. Did I miss it? Not really, no. When I stopped racing, I'd, I'd had enough. Do I miss even watching it? Mm. Right now, I could have told you go to hell this morning, I want to stay home and watch Sebring. But no, I watched the first 20 minutes or so. Uh, and when I go home later on this afternoon, I'll probably tune in and watch it again. But no, I really don't miss it at all. Subscribe now to our YouTube channel for the very best of Transworld Sports.